Now back to our Bonehead Detectives. And the skull rattling continues. Watch, this one's my favorite. Ugh. Well, now at least I think we can agree that headbutting did not die out with the dinosaurs. You're right. I mean, everywhere you turn, you see animals sparring and jousting to be top guy in the herd. It doesn't matter if you're a giraffe or a triceratop. That's bonehead detective Phil Curry. He and his team are in Alberta, Canada, where they're digging up even more information about the habits of that three-horned headbutter, Triceratops. This is where Phil found a bone bed full of Triceratops fossils. He's trying to get a fresh angle on the mystery of Dinosaur Park. Why did so many Triceratops die here? The original bone bed is about half the size of a football field, and it extends in basically one layer through this hill, across a saddle region, through another hill. Um, there are literally thousands or maybe even millions of bones in this bone bed. And finding so many Triceratops all in the same place makes Phil think they had more in common with these buffalo than just the horns on their heads. Like, if all these millions of buffalo were Triceratops, whoa, that's kind of freaky. If you think that's freaky, imagine if a whole herd of them got wiped out all at once. Phil's working in a Triceratops graveyard. We discounted the majority of uh, scenarios that we came up with for various reasons and came up with the idea that there had to have been a mass death that these animals uh, were, in fact, animals that were moving together and encountered some kind of a catastrophe. Catastrophe? Like what? A flood? Maybe. It could have been a flood. What? Was it disease? Possibly. What, a volcano erupted? Something like that? Mm, might have been. Well, which one was it? You don't even know, do you? It's still up in the air. No one knows exactly what happened over 60 million years ago, Sam. But Dave Ebert's a geologist. Questions about the ancient past are his specialty. Uh, a geologist? Uh, what's he going to contribute? As a geologist, what I'm able to contribute is a sense of time and a sense of place to the study. Time in the sense that uh, the rock record that we have in Dinosaur Park comprises over two million years worth of time. A sense of place in the sense that I'm able to tell the paleontologists what the environments were like and what the processes were like during the life and deaths of these animals. All right, bonehead rock star Dave knows his stuff. But my friend Jack does most of the real work. Jack? Jack. Hammer. <laughs> good one. What's a dino dig without a good power tool, Joe? We're lucky you've got the humor angle covered. That leaves Dave free to tell us about the history of the area. Dinosaur Park, during the late Cretaceous, about 77 to 76 million years ago, was a lowland coastal plain. If you think of the northern reaches of Florida, southern Georgia, even into Louisiana, you've got the right visual model. Very swampy, some areas of dense forest, but essentially a very swampy, thickly green, lush, wet lowland, subject to small changes in sea level and very sensitive to storm winds. The migrating Triceratops probably never planned on staying here but they didn't check the weather forecast. The storm surges and swells would force the rivers that were already swollen to overtop their banks and flood out the entire coast plain. Once that started happening, it was just a matter of time before the large animals would essentially bite it. Here's a quick flashback 70 million years or so to Dinosaur Park. This is how the story ended for this herd of Triceratops. But the story isn't over yet. Millions of years have passed, but not that much has changed in the lives of herd animals. For Triceratops and wildebeest alike, danger may hide behind every bend in the river. One day they find strength in their great numbers, and the next day may be their last. Live by the herd, die by the herd. So at least we can close the file on one of the mysteries of Dinosaur Park. Yeah, but don't be sad. There are a few million more mysteries where that came from. Don't go away! We'll be right back! Meanwhile, back in the boneyards... We've got one last head case on the menu. I should warn viewers, though. Its appearance is a little shocking and may frighten younger children. Viewer discretion is advised. It's not that bad. Here, let me find it. Here's an example of Parasaurolophus in its native habitat. Bonehead Dave Weishample thinks this animal's horn was instrumental in its quest for a mate.
the crest itself is very, very fragile. It's built out of very thin bone. Probably couldn't withstand a lot of this head-to-head -head stuff like you see in bighorn sheep. So if it wasn't for headbutting, then what good was it? What else would it be for? It was a big mystery at first. There was no shortage of theories, though. Some people even thought it was a snorkel. Uh, I'll buy the snorkel theory. Well, put your money away, Sam. Swedish scientist Carl Wiemann figured it all out. Carl Wiemann in Uppsala got himself a duck-billed dinosaur with a hollow crest. He looked at it and said, it looks like a trombone. It was a trombone. It was for making loud courtship noises. This is what the musical Parasaurolophus skull looks like on the inside. And this is how he called his girlfriend. He would expel air through his nasal passages. The air reverberated through the hollow chambers inside the horn. Voila, the world's first trombone. Weird. How did it sound? Dave Weishampel thinks he knows. Well, this contraption that I've got in my hands here is, in fact, a model of the crest of Parasaurolophus. It's the right size and the right shape for Parasaurolophus. It's built out of PVC tubing. And the reason I built it was to get a better sense as to the kinds of sound that Parasaurolophus would have made. So why don't I play it for you? Ah. Uh. Sounds of Saturday night in the Cretaceous. Oh, and love is in the air. So you're telling me that's really the sound of Paris Rolf is out tooting his horn, trying to get a date? If you listen to the experts. No wonder they're extinct. So there you have it, Allie. The case we like to call the mystery of the crazy Cretaceous cranium. Pachycephalosaurus, Triceratops, and Parasaurolophus. As we found out today, although they looked bizarre, their skulls served a purpose. Yeah, you know, whether it was uh, cracking heads or <laughs> getting the girl. <laughs> These guys really had it going on upstairs. And we covered a lot of ground today. Of course we did. A good detective leaves no stone unturned. Unless it's really heavy. Yeah, but then we just have to break out Mr. Jackson T. Hammer, right? What? Jackson T. Hammer. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. So how's Mr. Center? He's not the center. He's the kicker. No, he's not. He's the center. He's a kicker. Uh-uh. Kicker. No. Yes. What is this? So, what, are you going out what? with Captain Chewing Team or something? Yeah, what, what is it to you? What is this? What is this? This isn't an argument. This is a contradiction.